And we are live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the December 14th work session of the East Hampton Town Board. Carol, would you please read the roll call? Councilwoman Burke Gonzalez. Present. Councilman Lee. Present. Councilwoman Overby. Here. Councilman Bragman. Here. Supervisor Vance Glayak. Present. Please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Today's work session will begin with the public portion where any member of the public may address the board on any issue. We ask that you please keep your comments to three minutes or less. That will be followed by uh, a discussion of bids by Jeannie Carrozza, our purchasing agent, and a presentation for the Senior Center Selection Committee recommendations for the architectural and engineering services for a new senior center. Dan Patrizio will be leading that. She's our Director of Human Services. And that'll be followed by liaison reports. And we do have a couple of uh, resolutions to offer today. So without any further ado, Jason, if we could go to the phone lines. Do we have any callers? Yes, we do. I'm unmuting our first caller now. Thank you. Hello, caller ending 7567. You are on the air. Hello. Oh, they just dropped. All right. I'll, let's see if they're, uh, let's give them a moment to see if they want to uh, reconnect. You only had the one caller I had, on the line? I had one. Oh, there we are. Yeah, okay. One caller was on the line. Now another is. So give me a second. Sure. <laughs> Hello, caller 8764. You're on the air. Hello. Good morning. Uh, this is Dave Buddha. Yeah, I, I was trying to connect earlier, and there was some problems. Um, I was taken by um, Councilwoman Overby's comments at uh, last week's meeting relating, I think it was a discussion at the... Uh, Wayne Scott Citizens Advisory Committee uh, concerns about overclearing of properties, uh, overclearing that could occur either prior to or without benefit of a, any building permit having been issued for either residential or commercial property, or sometimes after a building permit has been issued and not in conformity with the approved clearing plan. Uh, obviously, such complaints have been made by many CACs in the past, Amagansett, Springs, etc. I wanted to throw out an assignment, if you will, for anyone that's willing to take it up. I'd like you to drive by 1179 Fireplace Road, also known as Springs Fireplace Road. Take a look at that property for which this, the uh, Ordinance Department has issued a violation notice for clearing without benefit of any building permit. Uh, I believe the only trees standing on that property are some that might be within the uh, street right of way in the front of the property. But the bulk of the, the balance of the property is virtually, certainly way more than 75% cleared. So the, the assignment for anyone that's willing to look it up and take, take this up is what if anything has happened as a consequence for the owner of the property and for the company, hopefully licensed by the town, uh, who did the clearing? I have in numerous instances of reporting such activities I have yet to see any actual significant legal consequence befall the owner or the clearing uh, company. And this would be a, a perfect example for all of you to become educated on how well our town ordinances work as they're presently constituted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And, you know, we have received complaints of uh, over clearing. And that is something that we're looking into addressing to make the code stronger. Uh, as a result of those instances. So thank you for calling. Yeah, I just want to chime in. I'm working with Mark Abramson in the Natural Resources Department to um, get some stronger language and also um, hopefully fines. There have been fines issued in the past. They are nominal compared to what, um, uh, you know, actually has happened. And so I, you know, uh, we're we're working on it, and I hope to come up with, um, you know, working with the, our lawyers and also working with the natural resources to come up with legislation that we consider first part of this of the coming year. 
I'd just like to add well, one thing that. I think, I'd like to point out is there are obviously many, many more owners and builders and developers than there are companies that do tree clearing work in the town of East Hampton, and all of them should be licensed as home improvement contractors. And I think that they are the ones that would be most efficient and effective to educate and, if appropriate, penalize if they don't know the rules and follow them. Thank you. Thank you, David. I was just going to add that I think that there are procedures we could put in place, whether it's having the surveyor stake the uh, edge of clearing uh, and having, you know, steps that you can't proceed with your construction if you uh, if you violate those envelopes, et cetera, uh, you know, so that there are real consequences that go beyond just uh, putting, you know, uh, a code section change in uh, and even some of the fine schedules that um, I think one of the most effective ways to deal with it would be to have construction come to a pause. So there's a real disincentive uh, to violate those uh, and, and real real consequences. So we're, we're looking into that. You know, I, I'd hope to have something uh, in draft form to review early in the new year. Yeah. But thank All you right. for calling. I just would, oh, I would, you're welcome. I would, I would welcome any of you that researches that particular property that can report back to the board. I'll be listening as to what the circumstances were and what the consequences were that were meted out beyond a stop work order, which apparently was issued, which simply stops everything in place and makes the bad situation uh, remain in place as it is. Thank you. Thanks for calling, David. Do we have any other callers on the line, Jason? Yes, we do. And I'm unmuting now. Hello, uh, caller ending seven. Comment, okay. you're, uh, I don't, there you are. I, I don't have a comment, but your live your live stream cut off. Just so you know, my live stream cut off. Give me a second. I apologize. Let me. Yeah. Uh, it's still running on YouTube, so let me just go make sure that's absolutely taken care of. My apologies. But no comment. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks for calling in to let us know. <laughs> yeah. The live stream should be up and running again. It might take a few seconds um, for our live stream server to uh, kick in, but um, our um, our channel's back up and running, and we never stopped on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Um, do we have any other callers in? Yes, we on do. I'm unmuting now. Hello, caller ending 9494. You are on the air. Hello. Hi, um, my name is Jenna Schwerzman, and I am calling on behalf of the Surfrider Foundation Eastern Long Island Chapter as their chapter coordinator. And we would just like to reemphasize our support for the ban on the sale of helium or lighter than air gas balloons. Um, as we mentioned before in our letter of support and by calling into previous meetings, our volunteers regularly pick up balloon debris from East Hampton beaches, and we think banning the sale is necessary for keeping our oceans and beaches clean. So we hope that the East Hampton Town Board will vote to make this better change for our environment. Thank you. Thanks so much for calling in, Jenna. And uh, I don't know what the status is of that resolution. Do you, do you happen to know, Sylvia? Is that? Yeah, it's on today. We're going to be it's considering it today. <laughs> so it's in your. Okay, well, there you go. There Thanks you go. Thanks for calling in and offering your support, Jenna. We appreciate everything Surfrider does to keep our yeah. waters clean. Um, we have any other callers on the line? Mr. Supervisor, we have no other callers on the line. Uh, the other person is just still saying there, but they have no comment. Understood. In that case, I think we could move on. Do we have Jeannie Carosa in the waiting room? Yes, we do, and I am admitting her right now. Thank you. Good morning, Jeannie. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Just getting yeah. my work together. Um, 
Our first bid today to accept is the purchase delivery of jet skis. Finally, after the third bid, we have uh, some jet skis. Um, the apparent low bidder is Maxwell Motorsports, and um, jet skis are $18,199 each, and we will be purchasing two. Um, next, we have a bunch of extensions. The first extension is for snow plowing at the East Hampton Airport. Southampton Excavation and Site Development is the um, contractor for that. The next extension is for the annual generator maintenance contract and Commander Power Systems is the contract for that one. The um, extension of agreement for the audit services for the CPF uh, Community Preservation Fund um, is Colin and Danowski. Um, next is another extension for the professional management services for Camp Hero Wastewater, and that's CMJ Graywater. And then um, the next is going to be a resolution in for um, a source fault contract, which is a national cooperative, and that's for the purchase of the um, comfort station. It's a turnkey comfort station. Um, we previously bid that. Um, in the amount of $754,000, but it was way over budget. But through the source well contract that came available to us, um, we can buy the precast restroom for the amount of $412,000. $412, I can't even talk this morning. $412,708. And um, that's through American Restroom. And the only thing we have to bid is the uh, for the foundation and some of the site work. And we'll be saving considerable money doing that way. And um, we will be noticing auto glass bid and also Star Island um, reconstruction. And that's coming up. The Star Island is coming up in January. And lastly, um, we did an RFP for the architectural and engineering services for a new senior center. And Diane Patrizio is here for that recommendation. And I have to say it, it was a long and thorough process and um, hope, hopefully you'll agree with our recommendation. Thank you. Can I just go back to the, to the comfort station? Is that for the Westlake comfort station? That's for the Westlake one, I'm sorry. And, and you know, I the outside of it we can clad it so that it you know is in keeping with um you know yes. the community the outside, characters the down gonna there be, it's going to be cladded in uh and cedar uh, cedar clapboard uh and the vernacular is going to be in, in touch to what we have I'll, I'll resend everything to the board but yes um that the the way that we did this again saved probably close to 60 percent on what the original bid came back is um, it will be shipped across America, uh, but it's built in a very dry location, so it's very strong. But then what you can do is you buy the base, and then you add on to what you want with the vernacular, if there's either outdoor coloring or the different roofs we want to also. But yes, that's exactly right, Kathy. Awesome. Thanks, David. Thanks, Jeannie. Any other questions or for Jeannie? Comments? Thank you so much, Jeannie. You're welcome. Have a great day. Well, she's gonna say, I'm on. going to sit on with... Um, <laughs> to watch okay. Diane's presentation and support. <laughs> okay, well, stick around. I am gonna go back to uh, public comments just for a minute. Since we have a, a relatively light agenda today, I'm gonna make an exception. I understand we had a caller who called in just after the public comments closed. So I'd like to go back to the phone lines for a moment. Right. We could. Of course, I'm muting now. One second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello, caller ending 0471. You're on the air. Hello. Okay. Good morning. Mary Ella Moeller. Um, I want to talk about the senior um, committee. Um, I want to let you know that you need to have a cross section of the total senior population of the town of East Hampton, just not current or retired employees of the town or people that attend programs such as the lunch or exercise or other programs. But you need to have people that don't attend, that aren't former or present employees of the town on the committee so that they can offer viewpoints of what needs to be 
on the senior uh, how, um, uh, committee um, that needs to be there for you. Uh, the senior population is 26 and a half percent of our population of East Hampton Town. And of course it's growing because medical services are better and people are getting older. The center needs to support the people aging in place and we need to have people that are on the committee that will um, decide what the center should be like that are familiar with this concept and will support it and will work with the people that are already on it. And I know that uh, seven years ago, my committee presented that East Hampton Town needed to have a new senior place, and it's taken seven years for you to even look at it. So thank you, and I want to make sure that the committee is represents a total senior population of East Hampton Town. Thank you. Thanks for calling, Mariella. And I, and I just want to say that we agree with you and that we will have uh, broad public engagement as we move forward to make sure that we're providing the needs and services that the community supports. And by the way, I want to thank you for sending me that really nice Christmas video that you sent out, wishing all of us a uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. So uh, it's good to hear from you. We haven't heard from you in a while. Uh, you take care and enjoy well, the holidays. Well, uh, Peter, I want to mention that no one from our committee has been asked to be on any of this, and no one has, no one from the committee has been asked to give any comments of work that you've done on this. And I feel that's very remiss because. We were the ones that initially brought up the idea, and you've left us out in the cold. And so I'm saying to you, you need to think of your appointments and do the right thing. Thank you. Well, Mariella, thank you. And, and as you know, uh, we've searched for a location for several years that would accommodate uh, an expanded senior center. We only recently were able to close the deal after several years and uh, now are in ownership of that parcel out uh, next to Abraham's uh, path uh, and the Terry King ball fields. And so the first step is to bring on a firm that can help us go through the process of architectural design and engineering. And again, the next step will be engaging the public. So. You know, we will be reaching out uh, to the general public and, and to seniors particularly to make sure that they're engaged in the process and that they can make, uh, you know, their their voices heard as to what they think we need in terms of programming, uh, space, layout, et cetera. I mean, this is a, a community center. Uh, it won't be solely for the purpose of uh, serving seniors, but that will be the primary focus. And we look forward to continuing and having that public engagement. Yes, and that was what we said in our report. It should be a community center, just not to serve seniors, but to serve the entire community. And I would like to say that we expect you to appoint someone from our committee to be part of that process since we have thoroughly looked into things that need to be in that type of community center. So we are expecting to have people from our committee on that so we can offer our valuable expertise. Thank you. Understood. Thank you very much, Mariella. And again, uh, enjoy the holidays. Same to you and same to the board. Thanks, Take care now. So uh, moving on, let's go back to that senior center discussion and the recommendations of the selection committee. And we have, I believe, Diane Patrizia will be leading us through that. Jeannie Carosa, who's on the committee, is also on the line, along with uh, Alexander Kabaz and I think Jenny Mulligan. Yep, they're being let into the room right now. Excellent. I'm not on the line now. Here you go. Oh, you got me on? Yeah. Oh, they just let me in? 
No. And uh, pl if you could please uh, make sure that your TV is muted in the background, uh, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay. So you're going to mute it, right? Yeah. Morning, Jenny. How are you? Uh We're just waiting for, uh, I think, a couple others to join. Diane, are you prepared to begin the presentation? Yes, I am. Great. Looks like Alex is having trouble connecting to audio. Oh, okay. Oh, there he is. Diane, are you able to share the screen? Yes. I Am I sharing the screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Then, yeah. I mean, I was concerned, but okay. So, should I begin? Please do. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Supervisor and Town Board members. I'm very happy to be presenting the recommendation for architectural and engineering services as selected by the new Senior Center Selection Committee. I have a PowerPoint presentation and will be sharing the screen. But first, I'd like to give a shout out to all the seniors that I know are watching at the center right now, because I know they've been waiting for this moment. Um, and joining me on this Zoom is Jenny Mulligan, who is the chair of the Senior Center Committee, and Alexander Cabaz, who is the committee member and former property owner. I'd like to begin with some background. The Town of East Hampton requested proposals for professional architectural and engineering services for a new senior community center located at 403 Abraham's Path in Amagansett. The RFP was available June 24th, 2021 and was due back July 22nd, 2021. Some project overview. The town project was defined as follows. While senior centers of the past provided basic support services such as nutrition, transportation, and social programs, new contemporary senior centers exemplify the need for additional, more comprehensive community-based services that meet the varying needs and consumer demands of the aging population. The challenge is to continue offering services that meet the needs of older participants and their families, while also providing new innovative programs that support the physical, mental, and social well being of the town seniors and attracting and benefiting seniors that have never considered utilizing the services of the current center. With that in mind, the new larger center facility needs more space to accommodate the current and future needs of the senior nutrition program and the adult daycare program, provide properly spaced spaces for offices, conference room, and a lunchroom for staff, ample parking for seniors, staff, and the town's transportation buses and vans, provide a permanent home for the East Hampton Food Pantry, provide space for wellness programs such as yoga, dance, meditation, and health screenings, provide space for more enrichment programs such as healthy living lectures, provide comfortable spaces to hold book clubs, card games, art classes, and more, provide space for movie screenings, provide a welcoming lobby area where seniors can gather and socialize allow for multiple activities to take place simultaneously, provide G facility. Also, the town embraces inclusive and universal design, including design for differing abilities, 
gender dynamics, amenities for cultural activities and public spaces. The new senior community center will be a public space and design decisions should consider how to extend these functions to as many members of the community as possible. In 2017, the town board agreed that the new senior center would provide a permanent location for the East Hampton Food Pantry, which currently occupies, oh, I forgot to do my slide, sorry, which currently occupies a temporary space behind town hall. Since the town board is pursuing, pursuing a net zero energy facility, the new senior center will be designed to ensure that the building envelope and all energy use of the building is highly energy efficient. It is the strong preference of the town that the annual energy consumption equals the amount of energy generated entirely from on-site renewable energy systems. Now I'd like to provide some information regarding the selection process. As per the RFP, the selection committee will review all proposals and recommend the professional whom the committee deems to be the most capable of providing the services sought herein. The committee may consider various factors, but not limited to the professional's credentials, experience, and the committee's assessment of the professional's ability based upon the submissions made or subsequent inquiries or interviews. This slide lists the members of the selection committee who evaluated the proposals for the new senior center. As you can see, the committee is comprised of community members and professionals and East Hampton Town staff. Each member brought their experience and knowledge to this process. The RFP identified the major factors and criteria to be considered while scoring the RFP submitted. In the RFP, the major factors to select the firm for this project were under firm qualifications and staff experience, expertise in architectural and engineering services, 20 points, expertise in construction and cost management, 10 points, expertise in green energy modeling and building practices, five points. Under the project, thorough understanding of the purpose and scope of the project, 15 points. Approach to executing the project and community engagement strategies, 10 points. Similar projects and community facility experience, 10 points. Knowledge of East Hampton vernacular and aesthetic, 10 points. Being familiar with applicable federal, state, and local laws and regulation, 10 points, as well as being familiar with design wellness and holistic design, five points, and cost five points for a total of 100 points. To keep the selection process Proceeding smoothly, the selection committee established timeline for the completion of the tasks required. This process included June 24th, 2021 was when the RFP was issued. July 2021, the potential firms posed questions that the RFP raised to them. August 2nd, 2021, potential firms were given a tour of the existing center. August 12th, was the extended opening date due and 15 proposals were received. Late August, 2021, all 15 proposals were reviewed by purchasing and deemed complete, having met all the requirements. September 7th, 15 proposals were distributed to the selection committee to review and score. September 30th and October 1st, the selection committee met, met to discuss the 15 proposals. October 1st, the selection committee narrowed the list to the top four firms to interview. On October 28th and 29th, the selection committee interviewed the top four firms. On November 5th, the selection committee narrowed the list to their top two firms to bring back for second interviews. And November 19th, the selection committee interviewed their top two, two firms. And on November 23rd, the selection committee discussed the top two finalists and selected R2 architecture. 
The recommendation, R2 architecture. The selection committee recommends R2 architecture based on qualifications and competence in relation to the scope and needs of the project. The following is a list of several distinctive qualities R2 architecture demonstrated that the selection committee believed were essential for orchestrating a successful project. R2 delivered an all around dynamic and fully comprehensive presentation. R2 has a long history, history of similar project experience, creative, creating innovative public buildings. R2's impressive design plans fulfills the functional needs of the community while keeping with the character of East Hampton Town. R2 has experience designing and building net zero, zero energy facilities. R2 architecture displayed a connection to the community, experience in senior centers, They've received over 300 design awards. 100% of their public projects are, came in at or under budget. And they have designed more than 50 cafes, coffee bars, and grab and go eateries. This slide displays the faces of the R2 team. They attribute their success to teamwork, dedicated designers who work in a very productive partnership with their clients. They strive to consistently produce facilities that are enjoyable, yet produced on a budget with cost-effective, durable materials and timeless results. Their proven strategies include a collaborative team approach with innovative solutions with a mind on the budget. The town of East Hampton has declared a climate emergency and the new senior center is to be designed as a net zero facility. The R2 team demonstrated their ability to design, to design a new senior center to the net zero energy specifications requested in the RFP. The team has described their approach to a highly energy efficient building design and the inclusion of on-site renewable energy and electric heat pump heating systems to result in a net zero energy facility. Given their collective experience in energy modeling, the net zero building and sustainable design, the selection committee is confident that the new senior center will raise the bar for town projects moving forward and support the town's renewable energy goals and climate emergency declaration. The art to architecture consultant team includes multidisciplined engineering consultant, structural engineering consultant, environmental design consultants and lighting designers focused on delivering sustainability to the planned and built environment, structural engineering and land surveying firm, multidisciplinary cost management firm, and they will also be working with one of the foremost food service consulting firms in the world. The next few slides highlight R2's experience with senior and community centers, along with some photographs. This is the list of senior and community centers continued. And this slide displays the layout of the levy senior and community center, which R2 designed. The importance of community outreach and involvement. R2 is experienced with and understands that effective public engagement is a key element to the project, as well as maintaining the quality needed to sustain the facility for years to come. R2 envisions a holistic initial effort that combines information gathering, community outreach, and programming. The intent of this effort is to establish the goals, parameters, and technical requirements that will guide the subsequent design phases and to obtain community consensus for the project. In this example of community outreach for Frisco Park, a survey was used so those in the community could participate and share their vision. They took the initial reactions and came up with goals which were later refined. 
the community wanted an inviting building, which was memorable, beautiful, and authentic. So in closing, why did we select the R2 team? They're creative. They have senior and community center expertise. They produce resilient designs. They're engaged communicators and they utilize continuous design costing. Uh, this slide shows the next steps, which is for the town board to appoint R2 by board resolution and the town attorney to draft the contract. And then the staff would meet with R2 to develop our community engagement plan. Uh, the final page lists the attachments, which are all posted on the town website, should anybody wish to uh, see them. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Diane. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the work of the committee um, in the selection process. You obviously did a very extensive number of uh, meetings and outreach and discussions to arrive at this recommendation. Are there uh, questions or comments from board members at this point? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask, um, um, I saw that the, I realize this is in a preliminary stage, but I, I was looking at the calendar or the schedule and it looked like a community, the public engagement was scheduled to last, as I recall, but, you know, between February and March over a period of like seven weeks, mm -hmm. which seemed, uh, I'm not sure what that seven weeks consisted of and maybe uh, kathy you can explain what that that is well we would have to do you know obviously we'd have to sit with them you know internally and go over the project once we had the contract uh finalized and we would have to talk about a community engagement how we want to do it obviously right now we're living in a virtual world so we need to figure out you know how we do charrettes or forums or is there a way to do virtual open houses so i think if you know things continue the way they are we're going to have to get creative which they have that experience of doing this community engagement process via um you know the virtual world um we didn't include that slide because this is you know going to be a complicated co contract because there are so many subcontractors, you know, uh, so we're hoping that we can get this, if we can get the contract worked out, you know, over the next four weeks, we can get started in mid-January. Get, get started on the re-envisioning, on, pro the, on the process of community engagement? Yes. Yeah, yes. you have to develop yes. the community engagement plan and that's scheduled to be done during the mid-January uh, timeframe. And then community engagement will proceed once that plan is, is arrived upon. So there'll be further discussions and development of the community outreach plan. Obviously, uh, you know, we, we've already heard from uh, a member of the former uh, committee uh, who's very interested. And in, in, so I'm sure that those folks are already aware of this. I know the, the seniors that currently use the uh, center are highly attuned to this uh, announcement. And uh, so I expect that community uh, involvement will only build from this point forward. And so we're looking for that. Uh, but how to reach the, the general public, you know, that's always a challenge. We, um, we have a, a number of projects that we've taken up over the years uh, and sought community engagement. And, uh, you know, in some cases people weren't even aware that the project, which had been vetted for two and a half years, was until it was begun that that uh, that we'd even considered it. So, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that we're getting the involvement of the public and, and not just seniors. This is a community center. Maybe the primary focus is for seniors. But again, it's an inclusive design that we're looking for. And um, I'm excited that this is probably the first major project that the town will undertake with a net zero uh, baseline, um, you know, in response to our emergency declaration regarding the climate, climate change. And uh, so I'm pretty thrilled about, about where we are. 
So, so, so can I assume that the, you know, there was a, there's a calendar in the materials that we were given that, that indicated, you know, like a seven week period for community engagement. I believe it was like 42, you know, 42 days or something like that, right. which seemed inadequate to me, but is that, you know, is that a target? Is that written in stone? Why, why, why does it seem inadequate? I mean, we did community workshops for the airport over, you know, two or three week period. I mean, if, if you've got different programs lined up over the course of six weeks so that you can get people, you know, where they're comfortable being, how could that be too short a time period? I mean, I, like I think it, I think it's much shorter than the, the airport. Yes, we did the work, sh- the, the small breakout groups in a short period of time under pressure, but the entire process lasted much longer than that. It just seemed like, you know, are you going to have, uh, you know, are you going to have, um, you know, work sessions, you know, three or four work sessions devoted to this? It just seemed like not, it, no. it was going to happen yeah, pretty quickly and it was compressed. Having- I'm sorry, Jeff. I apologize. It's hard with Zoom. Go ahead. I said it just seemed like it was a fairly compressed period of time to complete uh, community engagement. It's it's been compressed to seven years, I think. Mary Ellis said so. You know, <laughs> no, this is a continuation of, of an effort that's been going on for multiple years, and I think you know, in terms of arriving at a new design, you know, uh, think of it as an update, really. Um, you know, we, well, we Mary Ellis, have- sorry, Peter, Mary Ellis is complaining that her group has not been involved and wants a broader cross section of the community, which I think is a valid uh, desire. So, I mean, it's not, not really, f- and I might add, I mean, she's it's complaining. Not fair, it's not a, it's not an accurate characterization to say it's been compressed in seven years because uh, this is a brand new design and uh, there's, sh- I'm just I'm going to just note that I'm concerned that we have meaningful uh, community engagement before, you know, before the plan it hardens into a real plan. Uh, that, yes, that's, and, that, that's and that is if you looked at the timeline, that is how that's going to happen, Jeff. And there is the community engagement plan, which is the next step after we bring this firm on. Uh, yes, I did look at that, and that's why. And I'm so, to, to Mariella's concern, that process hasn't begun, and you know we're aware uh, of individuals and groups, and just the general public wanting to have, you know, a voice in this and to have some input, and we look forward to that engagement. I, I have a second concern, and that is, um, and I, I realize that this is a. Um, a focused presentation on the architecture and the selection of the architectural firm. I understand that. At the same time, you know, we operate um, within a framework of zoning and planning regulation that typically involves the planning department and the planning board. And there's no reference uh, to that in any of the materials that were given out, except I did notice um, in the uh, PowerPoint that came in late uh, in the day yesterday, there was literally a couple of words about zoning and planning. And, you know, I would, uh, you know, I- I'd ask Kathy to help, help us understand um, how the zoning and planning process, specifically how the zoning and planning process is going to be merged or meshed in with these timelines. And I think that's a very uh, critical uh, part of the process of moving forward on a a senior community center. So I would just say, Jeff, that planning and zoning uh, will be involved. I mean, we have a seven acre parcel. We intend for this project to be compliant with our zoning regulations in terms of setback and design. We will have planning staff involved in the development of this project, as they always are uh, with any project. And um, so, you know, it will get the same, you know, type of uh, a look and input that that any town project would. And, um, you know, we, we work within those parameters of, 
our town planning and zoning. So I don't, I don't think it's uh, any real concern to us. That's our standard practice. Well, the reason I bring it up is because the last time, uh, Kathy, you dealt with a set of senior uh, center plans, uh, what happened is um, those plans were drawn up. Uh, we you know, paid the architects and the engineers for those plans, and they wound up not fitting on the site that it was prepared for. So this is more than a technical you know, question. I'm saying that as we embark uh, on designing this project, um, I'd like to avoid that from happening. And I think um, the requirements of our, you know, our environmental law, the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act, um, are important to have in mind early on in the phases of this project, so that we get a we, we get an effective planning board review. That has not happened on a number of projects in the past, including the last senior center plan, which didn't fit on the land. And that's why we had to go around looking for a new piece of property. I, I disagree. Yeah. It, did fit, it did fit on the land. Um, but what we came up with, and I said it when the old town hall came down, we realized how disruptive it would be to be building a new center while the current program was going on. We also were getting, uh, got a letter from the planning board and it was concern about the, uh, the amount of development and redevelopment on Springs Fireplace Road. And we thought it best that, you know what, it really were two acres, you know, on, on such a busy corridor, wasn't the right place for the center. As the supervisor said, back in 2019, we started looking for new property. We got delayed because of the pandemic and we closed uh, earlier this year on this property. And, and I have to say from talking to folks and, and talking to seniors of all ages and all abilities, I think there's a great deal more interest from our senior community now that we are building a senior center on Abraham's path on this these seven wooded acres. I think it, it's more inviting. There'll be much more outdoor space uh, and I think it's it's a really exciting project, and it really came to life as the committee met with the um, read the proposals and you know spoke to first the top four and then down to the top two uh, architectural firms uh, that were uh, you know hoping to be able to you know steer this project for us. Well, you're omitting uh, the critical. Uh issue that I was raising, which was that there was not sufficient planning examination of the old plans to understand that a portion of that site was a park and couldn't be built on. And that made the plans that were drafted uh, not fit the site. That is a fact. And that's what prompted finding a new site and going through this process again. So all I'm suggesting is that at there's more to be done here than merely doing a chronology of what the architects are going to do to develop the plan. There is an equal amount of work that should be done right away from the start that produces a chronology of how we are going to engage the planning department and the planning board so that this project is thoroughly reviewed as if it were an application by the planning board so that we get effective planning review. This, this is going to be one of the biggest buildings built in the town of East Hampton. If I read, if I read the square footage correctly, um, it was up to 17,500 square feet. I'm doing that from recollection. Well, we haven't decided what the square footage is. The community engagement program is going to inform uh, how large this building needs to be. When uh, in the first generation, when we were looking to put it on Springs Fireplace Road, it was just over 18,000 square feet. But this process will will help us, you know, decide and, you know, again, we'll have the ability to, to have a great deal more outdoor space. I, I understand, I understand that, but the numbers that I cited, the numbers that I cited, were in the materials that were handed out. It was about 17,500 square feet. I'm just, I'm merely saying that there should be an equal, e equally detailed chart and work that outlines 
the planning process so that we so that we use the assets that we have in town hall, not merely for public engagement, which is very important, very significant, but also get in our, you know, our very capable planning department, our very capable planning board so that we, the public can know that this is going to get a thorough review, just like any other project, and that will comply with all of the environmental law requirements in doing that. And that requires a little bit of planning right now. Thank you, Jeff. I couldn't agree more that, you know, there's a lot of planning to do and a lot of review to take place. I'm excited that we have uh, a selected uh, recommend, uh, selection recommendation from the committee and that uh, we can move forward with drafting contract and public engagement and then get on with all of the uh, intricacies of designing and planning and review of this project so that we can actually get it completed uh, within the next couple of years. So thank you. Uh, anyone else have comments? I, I do. And I'm sorry, I'm having some uh, camera issues. So if uh, my hair looks better today, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed. It's coming in and out a little bit. It takes one to know one. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm very happy we're at this, at this point right now. So uh, Kathy, thank you very much for ushering this over the last four or five, maybe seven years now, uh, shepherding it. Um, to move forward. Um, while there's not a new design now, there's a new process. The new process has a new location. Uh, and also part of that new process is the, uh, the LEED certified building, which I think is uh, admirable. Uh, and I look forward to working with these organizations. Upon doing some research, I think the R2, the combination of uh, Ross Barney and then also Renetta Riley, uh, are going to be able to produce um, a project that East Hampton is going to be proud of not just for functionality, but also aesthetically. The combination of the two organization with Ms. Riley having a lot of lo lo local knowledge and worked in the area with buildings, not just on the, in East Hampton, but on the East End, she's gonna bring that experience. Uh, but then going to Ross Barney, who has a lot of civil experience. I've actually been on one of their project sites, the River, river Walk in, in, um, in Chicago, not knowing it was them. It's pretty brand new, and uh, it's 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 a wonderful use of outdoor space. If you then take some of their, their locations that they've worked on, I think specifically uh, their case study location, which was the, the Levy uh, building, there's a lot of similarities to what we need as far as our, our senior slash community center that we're going to be building compared to the, the Levy building. Um, it showed a lot of the need for the interior use, use space that's workable, uh, that's adaptable. Uh, it brings a lot of the outdoor space in, which this new site is a very beautiful site. I don't have to tell Mr. Kabaz that. He's lived there for years. Um, but also what it combines in the Levy space, which is in Evanston, Illinois, is a functional park that was there already. That functional park for the, for the Levy space, I believe, is about 24 to 27 acres total. Ours here will be about 27, sorry, 21 acres approximately, uh, where it has ball fields, walking paths, other other uh, community aspects of recreation to it. So uh, in choosing uh, uh, R2 as the architects move forward, I, I very much see them as, as an organization that has done this in the past, and I think they can do this harmoniously with East Hampton on our site. There, there's, there's a lot of correlation there. So I thank uh, Jenny. Uh, thank you very much for leading that. Uh, I do know Jeannie's going to help us out as we go forward, because this is going to be a little more expensive now. Uh, Jeannie and I have just talked about Westlake. Everything's a little bit more expensive now, so we have to be prepared for that. But again, I used the word crisis a while back. This is something that is generations are going to use this facility. So I think putting our worth up front right now at getting the best uh, is something that's going to play out. And then we're all going to use it. I'll use it. I know my family's going to start using it too. So I, I look forward to getting a shovel in the ground. And, and I appreciate the efforts of the committee. And I look forward to the process moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I just, I just want to just take a moment and uh, thanks Alexander Kabaz for agreeing to make the property available to the town. Um, you know, we searched high and low over uh, many years trying to find a suitable location. And uh, we think this is just such a great uh, location for all the reasons David uh, Lee's just mentioned. Um, and uh, so, again, on behalf of uh, the board and the community, I want to thank you. Uh, Alexander for 
uh, your contribution here as well. I just wanted to add a, a quick comment to, to say that the the earlier and the more meaningful collaboration that we can um, make happen between these talented architects and our uh, capable planning department and planning board, the the earlier we can do that and the more they're collaborating from the start, the, the speedier the project will go through and the more likely we are to have um, something that really fits within the character of the town of East Hampton. So yeah, I, 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 I agree speed. with that comment, Jeff, and I'm really excited also that we have a new planning director now. Um, you know, we enthusiastically welcome Jeremy Samuelson. I know he'll be a huge asset to us as we move forward in, uh, you know, checking all the boxes on the planning and zoning and community engagement. So uh, very exciting time, I think, for us here after working uh, so many years uh, diligently trying to make this happen, get to this point. I want to thank especially Kathy Burke Gonzalez for all of her hard work. This has not been an easy uh, project to get to this stage, uh, both through the land acquisition, land search acquisition, uh, and, and previous efforts. So I want to thank everybody who's been involved to get it to this point. If I could, you know, just point out that um, Eric Shantz, our assistant planning director, has been involved from the beginning. Eric was on the selection committee. He attended the interviews, as did Marco Wu in planning. So, you know, it has been a collaboration with the planning department from the get-go. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and Can I just add my two cents, Peter? Sure, absolutely, Sylvia. So, yeah. yeah, sorry about that. I just want to also thank um, Kathy and the team and the architects were looking at net zero, which is something that the town really wanted to move forward with, with any building that, that's coming up in the future. Um, you know, the aesthetics are very important to me, as well as the functionality of the building. And so, you know, having local community character will be an important part of looking at least the outside of the building. Um, and uh, thank again, Mr. Kabaz, for this beautiful property and making it available in the absolute, as far as I'm concerned, right location. We're near the youth park. We are near Terry King Ballfield, uh, right next to Terry King Ballfield. I mean, there is a synergy there that I think is important for the community um, as a community you know, based place for, for kids and adults and seniors. So um, I, I really am, am thankful that Mr. Kabaz was able to make this appropriate, um, uh, I mean, uh, for us to be able to purchase it. And, and I think it's so appropriate. But and so, so thank you. I look forward to moving this project along. So to that end, I would like to put a resolution on for Thursday uh to you know appoint r2 architecture as our uh, architect for this project so that we can then get the the account the the uh, town attorney's office to get going on the contract so we can thank you kathy we look forward here. to you. we look forward to you offering that resolution okay. thank you and again, thank you to the committee uh, and all involved to get us to this point. Diane, all the excellent work you've done at Human Services. I wanna thank you again. Uh, this has been a really trying time with the pandemic and, and the efforts of you and your staff and Human Services to meet the needs of the community and all the meals and everything else that you've had to deal with. And you've done such a, a splendid job. I just wanna thank you again on behalf of the board. Thank you, Peter. Okay, that concludes our, our work session uh, agenda topics. And uh, we can move on now to liaison reports. Kathy, sure. do you have a liaison report? I do, I just, I've got a couple of resolutions coming up in the, I guess we only have two meetings left of this year. So on Thursday, we'll be setting the, uh, the date for the annual organizational meeting. That's gonna be Tuesday, January 4th at 11 o'clock. On uh, Thursday, uh, next Tuesday, we're going to have the resolution um, to, to adopt the changes to the ethics code. Uh, I reached out to the Spring CAC after last week's presentation on the um, emergency communications cow and springs uh, to see if they wanted to express their preference for a, the siting of the 88 foot uh, tower, lattice tower that's on the trailer. Uh, we, the options were Maidstone Park, Springs behind Springs Library, and Gann Road. And uh, so far, I've only heard back from two members. Uh, 
a couple weeks ago, the Adolescent Mental Health and Substance Use Task Force met at East Hampton High School. Everybody recalls it's uh, not-for-profits in the community that work with kids and families, you know, the school districts, the, the, the police departments. And we had first time we met since COVID and uh, the educators all got us up to speed on, you know, what our kids are dealing with these days. And um, really what we decided is we want to broaden our uh, approach in 2022, that we're not just going to focus on adolescents. Um, and so I'm going to be looking to kind of repurpose that committee and, and expand, uh, broaden uh, to, to younger kids as well. And, and Adam Fine, the new superintendent of East Hampton School District, and I are going to be bringing back uh, our show on LTV, Honest Conversations, and, you know, and again, broaden uh, who we, you know, bring in as guests to interview. Um, and then I'm going to also have a resolution on for Thursday, three sets of exterior doors at the YMCA need to be replaced. They are, we believe the original doors. So they're, you know, over 20 years old. We have money in the um, YMCA capital reserve fund. So I'll have a resolution on uh, Thursday. There's a company that's on contract and it's just over $38,000. So we'll be voting on that on Thursday. And, uh, and I'm hoping, lastly, is that we'll be able to have a vote either Thursday or Tuesday on the license agreement with American Tower for the site at the Girl Scout camp. And uh, that's what I've got. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, David, do you have a liaison report for us? I do. Thank you very much. Uh, last week, we had a meeting of the Nature Preserve Committee. Um, we were discussing uh, about, I know uh, over a year ago, I think pre-pandemic, uh, the former chair, Zach Cohen, came in to discuss uh, potential changes to uh, Chapter 182, which defines nature preserves. And the board wanted to move forward with that. Uh, nature Preserve Committee is reorganizing with the subcommittee now to move that, uh, that, that forward to get it back to the town board for greater discussion. So I look forward to uh, seeing uh, information about that. I'll present it to the board hopefully early in the new year. Uh, we did uh, discuss uh, some other projects that have collaborations, one being the Laos Point Road, uh, work that we're looking to do in conjunction with other stakeholder groups. Since Laos Point is actually a nature preserve that actually has a management plan, uh, we have now dedicated uh, an individual that's going to be a liaison to that project. Uh, I'll make sure that Kathy is the CAC member and individuals of the Water Quality Technical Re uh, Advisory Committee will know that. And so we'll keep that individual in the loop. Uh, that would be Mike Patini. Um, the Nation Preserve Committee is interested about Stepping Stones. Stepping Stones is in Montauk. It's on old, it's old, old Westlake Drive, excuse me. Uh, and there's a view shed that has grown in with uh, Phragmites. They're interested in, in uh, potentially uh, moving forward with a Phragmite control or slash removal project there. I'm going to uh, do some more research and a site visit uh, over there tomorrow um, to look into it. Again, I'll bring some more information back to the board, but it's something that they were interested in also. Um, there's a couple management plans that the town board has recently discussed that uh, we uh, we had we discussed in work session. Um, I'll read four of those around uh, Fresh Pond, Grasslands, uh, Gold Dart, among others. Uh, for any comments or concerns, I wouldn't mind trying to get them to a public hearing in the first couple months of the year. Um, second of all, we, uh, lastly on there, uh, we discussed actually um, uh, potentially reviewing the management plan for Rods Valley, that'd be in Montauk, uh, to potentially include uh, uh, this description is a little bit more of appropriate uses for the pier, the fishing pier that is there, uh, to not include um, uh, uh, generator use or or uh, uh, added light sources there. And that's what the, uh, the Nation Preserve uh, Committee was discussing then too. Um, again, also this weekend, uh, sorry, this weekend, this Thursday, um, Jeannie discussed it, but I have a couple of resolutions that will be on, again, one being for the Westlake Comfort Station. Uh, Jeannie accurately described it. She was instrumental uh, to helping find and saving the town a couple hundred thousand dollars on this project. So I, I thank her a lot and I, th I thank her again publicly here for this. 
Uh, I will also have a proposal on there for uh, accepting proposals for uh, two cemeteries, uh, Colonial Cemeteries restorations, one being the John Parsons Cemetery on Hall Creek, and the other would be the Daniel Met, Met, Met a Table Edwards Cemetery at the new entrance of the Spring School. The funding line there will be coming out of the town's cemetery subcontract maintenance lines. Um, we had a discussion. Um, we're having discussions uh, with the East Hampton Historical Society, the Wooden Boat Society, and the, and the Life Saving Station Society, and begins at Life Saving Station, Station Society, working with Brian Frank and the Chief Environmental Analyst, who is our Chief Environmental Analyst, about doing a trail connector. Uh, that will take some work uh, and assistance. We will need approval through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We now have contact there, and we're going to move forward with that um, and design, and I'll bring that back. It'll just be a, a, a great trail. Uh, and I'll bring uh, more information back to the board about that. If you are interested in uh, commenting on that, let us know. Also, uh, what Jeannie did mention is that shortly, I hear better. <laughs> <laughs> I'll figure that out. Um, uh, next month, we've been planning on uh, working on a restoration or complete revampness of the Star Island and also the Wesley commercial uh, fishing docks. Uh, we've gone out and done engineering and we're going to go out to the RFP for the Star Island, the Star Island commercial docks shortly. Uh, this will take some coordination with the users that are actually um, at that dock also during the construction phases, but also our funding sources then too. So uh, I just want to make sure that that's, that's upcoming. Uh, it's going to be a big, big project out there. Uh, we had use of extra funding out there to send divers down uh, to see some to look at for damage. And there's a lot more damage underneath of there because whatever it was maybe 40 years ago um, renovated, it wasn't renovated uh, uh, all the way. And uh, this project will make sure that there will be long-term safety on the project there, and that design. So that will be upcoming. If you have any more uh, concerns or questions, please let me know. Um, but with that, that's my short liaison report. Thank you all. Thank you, David. Uh, Sylvia, do you have a report for us today? I do. I do. Um, so the Antibias Task Force met. Uh, Chief Mike Tracy. Uh, yeah, Chief Mike Tracy was on the uh, call, and he is going to be able to resume the diversity show um, starting at the beginning of the year. We've, he's got two people lined up. Uh, one is, uh, and I'm. I'm It'd be a surprise names as we get them to you, but I can tell you what the shows are going to talk about. One is Eastville Community in Sac Harbor, and the other show is that um, a member of our community was also a charter member of the U.S. Holocaust Museum, and so that would be the second show that would come up this year. So I think those are two very exciting um, folks and and uh, and subjects to be talking about. We've updated our brochure. It is completed and ready to go to the printer. I will be sending around a copy of all of it to you so uh, the town board can look at it. And um, we also had a brief discussion on uh, mental health issues. Uh, Edna Steck, as you know, is uh, on our committee for anti-bias task force, and uh, she was instrumental in, in talking with Fred Seal and moving forward with hopefully um, Stony Brook, Southampton Hospitals, Family Service League, and the police departments in getting programs for immediate help through some, you know, using um, iPads and doctors at the other end, you know, what we're seeing today in some of a, a medicine that they can, um, when police need it, and when someone needs it at three in the morning, they would be able to have a doctor at the other end to help, helping them uh, through a situation. Um, so the Community Housing Opportunity Fund also met. They're anxious to get direction on uh, writing the plan for East Hampton for the anticipated 0.5% uh, transfer tax. And they know that the town board is, um, needs to you know, kind of put forward a plan and they would like to be heavily involved in getting that plan written as um, you know, the uh, CHOF committee does work with the planning department and so we're hoping that many members on CHOF will also be working with the planning department and the town board to get that, that uh, committee together so the writing can begin. Um, so that, and we figure the plan should be available to the public probably by June. 
um, so that they can really weigh in on, on that part of the plan. So we're hoping that we can, you know, first part of the year, that's where we need to be with CHOP. Um, just a quick update on the Wayne Scott Hamlet plan and implementation. Lisa LaCurie is working on that. Um, she, her first meeting um, with the working group is going to be uh, the first half of January, we hope. And it might be towards the end of January, but we're working towards having it done on the first uh, half of January and start that process as well. And that's all I have. Thank you, Sylvia. Jeff, do you have a report for us today? Yeah, we met uh, the Airport Management Advisory Committee met on uh, Friday. Uh, Jim Brundage went over uh, some of the traffic uh, figures, uh, basically comparing uh, 2021 uh, year to date with 2019. He, he chose 2019 because 2019 was the last year not affected by COVID. And um, fr frankly, the numbers are pretty close. So it's it seems like the traffic is kind of back to normal, but I'm not sure the mix is because he noted that um, uh, the operations of jets were up uh, a really large uh, percentage, 48%. Uh, helicopters very slightly down. I'm not sure it was actually statistically significant. Turbos down and uh, piston planes uh, up a bit. And that, that makes sense because there have been more um, uh, small engine uh, pilots flying in and out of the airport. But uh, the figures are pretty close between 2019 and uh, 2021. There was some brief talk about... Um, the committee's uh, working with Steve Tuma on a on a, a complaint um, system that has the potential for being more accurate and uh, doing a better job of tracing uh, destinations and departures of existing uh, aircraft. Um, and there was some concern raised by um, a couple of the members who are uh, uh, opposing the airport as to whether or not um, if the town uh, takes action uh, to take the airport private and put restrictions on whether that could be changed in the future by a future town board. Um, and it appears that it could be. Uh, and uh, that was a, a concern. Uh, and also um, another uh, member of the public had asked uh, for the uh, costs uh, for our experts that were used during the re-envisioning process um, so that they could see exactly what the expenditures were. Becky Hansen was in on the meeting and agreed to help uh, access that information, which is apparently a public record. Um, and... Um, uh, Jim gave a report on, um, well, I, no, actually, then I wanted to say that we I've looked over the, um, the noise reports from Friday, December 10th, and uh, uh, Sunday, December 12th, the, week, you know, the weekend reports, and Friday, there were a total of 58 uh, complaints. The helicopters uh, were the largest proportion of those complaints, with the prop, prop engines uh, following, and jets were in third place. And on Sunday, the noise complaints, there were 36. Again, helicopters were leading the, uh, the race with 20 prop planes, uh, 11 and two jet complaints. And as the town board is aware, but I, I think the public should be aware, we got a letter from Jay Schneiderman, the supervisor of Southampton, um, on airport policy. Uh, I found it a little bit... Um, Sort of uh, offering something for everyone, but I'm not, or maybe little for everyone. I'm not really sure. It seemed like uh, uh, Jay uh, emphasized the um, economic importance, was worried about diversion of traffic to West Hampton, which our study actually said uh, uh, that West Hampton uh, Airport could handle all the diversion of East Hampton's traffic. Uh, but he, he did also mention uh, that he has... Uh, endured uh, many complaints from people who are noise affected uh, from, uh, you know, a wide geographic range, including, you know, Noyak and, uh, and points west, and uh, would like to see some relief to those people, but at the same time, uh, seem to be focusing on changing the routes in the sky, 
um, so he didn't like the northern route, uh, the November route, as they call it, and said that it had transferred a lot of traffic over Southampton. But uh, really, the letter concluded with him saying that we should probably just work with the FAA. And it seemed to me he was saying change the routes. And um, he was uh, worried about property values uh, in the estate sections of Watermill, Bridgehampton, and Sagaponic, indicating that um, they might lose value because uh, flying in on helicopters was a necessary amenity. So, in the end, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, what side of the issue Jay was on. He offered to participate with us in talking to the uh, FAA. But it, as I said, it had something for everyone, but I'm, I'm not sure that that adds up to much for anyone. But um, it's probably something that the public should be aware of. And that's really what I have today. That's the liaison report. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I just wanted to bring everybody up to date on the Suffolk County seven-day COVID positivity rate. And this is per New York State. It's 7.2% of those who were tested. Uh, we had seen uh, yesterday a huge surge in the number of people seeking to be tested um, at the very beginning of the day, which caused the traffic back up all the way uh, onto uh, the highway and up the shoulder for a short period of time. We want to thank uh, Code Enforcement and uh, Kevin uh, particularly uh, for uh, clearing out that traffic issue when it occurred. I think... Um, you know, that's indicative of the number of people who wanted to get tested uh, before visiting friends and relatives or traveling. And um, it also may have had something to do with the governor's announcement uh, that a mandatory mask policy is in place as of yesterday through January 15th for all businesses and public spaces, uh, unless that entity requires a vaccination confirmation prior to entry, in which case those vaccinated individuals would be able to uh, go maskless. Uh, this is uh, an effort um, to basically slow and prevent transmission of the disease throughout the holiday period. We ask for the, the public's uh, patience and compliance with the order. Uh, this is meant to keep us all safe uh, at a time when we had seen uh, pretty large surge in the past and um, you know for that type of um, holiday season where people are visiting others and the, the opportunity to spread at parties and whatnot increases significantly. So we again urge people to uh, comply with this mandate. Um, town hall has in all town facilities have been under this requirement uh, for um, just many months now. And um, so it doesn't mean any change for town hall. Um, but again, we ask if you're out in the grocery store or any other business that you please comply with wearing a mask. It's for your own safety. It's for the safety and health of others. We're continuing to offer vaccinations right here at town hall in the main meeting room. And as I said earlier, there's testing here. We've um, scheduled to administer uh, almost 1,500 doses uh, through January 24th. We still have availability on three clinics in January, January 10th, January 19th, and January 24th. You can go to the town website, ehamptonny.gov, and you'll see on the uh, top of the page, uh, it'll say coronavirus info. You push the red button, or you can go to the photograph that that has the, uh, the subheading of uh, vaccines and uh, click on that and it'll work you through that, that process of getting an appointment. Um, there has been a great deal of demand uh, for those booster shots. We're also administering first doses and all three vaccines are available, J&J, Moderna and uh, Pfizer. And um, so they've been very successful. The public's been very pleased to be able to have that access. I know that uh, local pharmacies, doctor's offices, Southampton Hospital are all offering vaccines. However, uh, due to the demand, uh, again, ahead of the holidays, um, some folks are now starting to find that it's difficult to find uh, prior to the holidays uh, vaccine. 
Um, again, keep checking with those all those various sources, and uh, we're booked up again until mid-January. Uh, but again, uh, please get vaccinated, get your booster. If you're already vaccinated, uh, this prevents severe disease and uh, death. The death rate and uh, severe illness rates are actually extremely low for those who have up-to-date vaccines. And Omicron is here, the latest variant, which uh, I think transmits three times faster and more easily than uh, the previous Delta variant, which was exponentially more transmissible than the original um, disease. So again, you know, go back to those, uh, if you've become a little more lax, go back to those protocols of wearing a mask around others and washing your hands and uh, we'll get through this with uh, a lower rate than uh, we would otherwise. Um, as a result of the pandemic, uh, we've seen costs uh, for housing and food and, and everything go up. And that's created even more food insecurity within our town. Our local food pantries have been busier than ever. They're at historic levels now. The Springs Food Pantry, I was speaking uh to uh, the person running that, and they said that they served uh, the previous week a new record, 255 families, which represented 1,133 people served in a single week. Um, those are astronomical numbers. Uh, the other food pantries are seeing also highly increased numbers. I've spoken with uh, Alice Hausnick, who uh, runs the Montauk Food Pantry. Um, she's seeing similar numbers uh, maybe even a little higher per capita uh, than we're seeing uh, in Springs. Um, and as you know, board members know, we recently gave them a $20,000 grant uh, to, uh, uh, similar grants have been issued uh, to East Hampton Food Pantry and Springs in the budget. And uh, so now we've um, also issued a grant. I would urge anyone uh, especially during this holiday giving season to consider making donations to all of our uh, various food pantries. Uh, they certainly will appreciate that. They, they will accept food of certain types. I, I urge you if you're planning on dropping off food that you contact them to see what types of foodstuffs they need. Um, but certainly a, a monetary donation makes it easy for them to purchase whatever they need. Um, and they are running uh, very large food bills. The cost of food's gone up and uh, the number of donations is starting to dry up, which is concerning because the demand is only increasing. So again, be generous during this giving season and think about your local food pantries and help, help our members of the community who are maybe less fortunate than many of us are. The wireless uh, draft code revisions um, from our consultant, uh, cityscape have been circulated uh, to the uh, internal committee. Uh, we've done some preliminary review of that. We'll be uh, meeting with our wireless communications committee uh, to further discuss um, the, uh, the code revisions uh, for personal wireless um, transmission sites, as, and they will also tend to inform the master plan over time to work to continue with that. As Kathy mentioned, uh, I think we're extremely close and, and uh, very soon we'll be able to uh, offer a resolution uh, to, to engage uh, with American Tower in a contract uh, license agreement for the construction um, and the placement of uh, emergency communications equipment at the Girl Scout camp. And uh, we will also have a resolution offered, I believe it's Thursday, to purchase additional equipment for emergency communications in Springs uh, that would help effectuate the location of the cow, the cell on wheels, temporary site. Uh, that equipment can be reused on a permanent site once that's constructed. And that I believe will be offered on Thursday. Last night was a meeting uh, with ACAC and uh, they, ahead of the new year, uh, decided that they would hold uh, elections ahead of uh, the organizational meeting. And um, Rona Plotman was, uh, again, uh, voted for as chair. Uh, no one else, uh, any other, the other person had withdrawn 
from uh, from consideration. Uh, Don Brophy is the secretary and vice chair is uh, Vicki Littman. Uh, congratulations to all of them. There was a presentation by Sarah Kautz from Preservation Long Island discussing National Historic Register, registering properties as national landmarks and the eligibility process and criteria were discussed as well as the uh, benefits. And she also discussed the National, National Historic Registry District designation for historic districts under that fed, federal uh, statute. Um, there was um, a great deal of interest in pursuing the NIPA LED street lighting. Uh, I believe we'll have a resolution to engage with NIPA for that. Um, and particular interest in converting the existing Cobra lighting on street poles, on uh, utility poles to uh, something more compatible with the historic district in downtown Hamlet of, of Amagansett in the business district to a, a more historic style lamppost type uh, design, uh, again, with LED lighting. And there's also interest in uh, putting some additional lighting in the main lot, which is has uh, limited lighting. Um, we had a brief uh, report from Seth Turner, the um, MGN school superintendent. Uh, they've had, you know, a uh, uh, quite a time, like most schools, uh, they are and have been in in person um, teaching. And that continues. Uh, he was pleased that uh, and thanked the town for providing uh, crossing guards at the school. Uh, we're happy to be able to do that. I know there was uh, a period of time uh, in the not too deep distance past where it was difficult to find uh, staff. We were short on staff resources. And again, if uh, members of the public are looking for a part-time job, you know, contact our human resources department uh, there may be some availability for a person to do uh, crossing guard or other uh, jobs with the town. So if you're looking for work, we do have part-time and full-time jobs available. And uh, let's see, the other, um, I mean, the other thing that he mentioned was that their uh, enrollment, as, as most of you may know, has changed quite a bit. It was interesting to me that the enrollment now is somewhere around the 200 number school-wide uh, of that uh, about 67 uh, children were in the three to six year old uh, class uh, classes size uh, in 2019 that number is pretty much doubled to 130 uh, so that's where I think the greatest increase in enrollment has occurred within those age groups um, the Montauk Chamber of Commerce had scheduled to hold a holiday event on the green in Montauk on Saturday with a rain date on Sunday. Obviously, Saturday was a very, very windy day. I think we had some 40 knot plus winds and driving rain. Uh, so the, the event uh, moved to Sunday. Uh, it was a terrific event. It, they had live music. Uh, Sarah Conway and the Playful Souls uh, played at the gazebo. They also had a cappello caroling group. And uh, I, I was fortunate enough to get to play and to accompany Gabriella Galeer, who's our administrative secretary in the town board offices, who uh, we've discovered has a really uh, phenomenal voice. And uh, she just sang beautifully, did a couple classic uh, jazz holiday tunes and uh there was hot chocolate served santa claus arrived uh and the kids all gathered around and then uh, we had um a group of uh young children i think they probably started at age five through maybe age 11 or 12 uh all line up in front of the gazebo and sang a cappello uh christmas carols uh, led by their musical director and conductor, our very own Nancy Atlas. So it was a really fun time. Uh, great to see people out and about in a safe outdoor setting. The weather did cooperate. It was cold, but uh, everybody was in very good cheer. Uh, so very, um, very fun time. 
So that concludes um, my report. I believe we have some resolutions. David, do you have resolutions to offer? I do. I'm more upset for missing the hot cocoa. Um, <laughs> I'd like to offer resolution 2021-1366 as a budget modification for the highway department, removing $9,500 from road surfacing material to $9,500 for other equipment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Pass and carry. Resolution 1367 is a budget modification for aquaculture, bringing $225 for, from part-time salaries to $225 for office expense. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Pass and carry. Resolution 2021-1368 is to accept a donation of, of the Chico Hamilton Memorial Bench. This is a gift from longtime friend, Marcia Norman, and his daughter, Denise Hamilton. Uh, they like to donate a memorial bench to the town of East Hampton to honor, honor Chico Hamilton, a legendary jazz drummer. This is to be placed at his former residence, 142 Waterhole Road in Clearwater, which is now a town CPF property. And hereby resolve that uh, the town board hereby gratefully accepts the donation of Marcia Norman and Denise Hamilton uh, to the town of East Hampton. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Pass and carry. We thank you for the donation. Resolution 2021-1369 is to adopt local law, amend chapter 84 on balloons. This is to um, ban the sale of balloons with lighter than air um, uh, heat or helium filled balloons. Second. Just a discussion, if you don't mind. Sure. sure. So uh, initially, when this resolution came up, I, I see a lot of a lot of things through the town in the town government through the lens of my kids. So I immediately thought, kept thinking about my kids. I brought this up and I and I discussed it with uh, 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 Trustee Susan McCall Heber, and initially I wasn't in favor of it. Um, I then had longer conversations with my kids. Uh, and then even when uh, trustee elect Cataletto came on and Leah Fromm was on there and I had a discussion with her after, and I saw it in her eyes. And then I went back and we we're at the beach out on that peak into our secret spot all summer long. And the kids kept seeing balloons and our waters come across as cross. You know, we saw every day, we saw multiple balloons going by. I had a greater discussion with my kids and I asked them, and they were fine with it. Uh, they think that there's other ways that we can still use balloons, but you know, in a way that they're not going to can't be released, non helium filled. Uh, so I want to thank, first of all, my kids, uh, uh, Leah from also, uh, call her out by name because she really had an impact on me in that conversation we had. Uh, and, and Susan for changing my mind on this because I necessarily wasn't in agreement with it. Um, and that was from just, I don't want to lose fun, but I think there's other ways that we can redesign fun for kids, which is still uh, uh, in a safe manner for the environment, the long-term effects of it. Uh, so I thank you uh, very much, Sylvia, and everyone for allowing me to um, take my time uh, in this discussion, but also um, for just changing my mind. Uh, but I want to let everyone know, I, I do it because of the kids, uh, but this is good for the kids and for the environment that they will inherit from us. So, so David, you. yeah, I want to thank you because uh, as the uh, lyrics go, children will lead the way. And in this instance, I think your children led the way for you. Um, and I hope they do that for others that might be doubters at this point in time. So um, so thank you for that discussion. I thought it was very helpful. And it's funny, so you calling it a doubter because I was a doubter going into this. And then, you know, when we had the work session and all of the young people came on from the high school and the Avenue school and whatnot, I remember running into Aubrey Peterson uh, downstairs uh, in town hall. And I said to him, you know, I was leaning towards not really supporting this legislation. And then I heard from the kids. And he said, can I go back and tell, you know, I guess it's the environmental awareness group or whatever yeah. the, the, at, the, at the high school that, you know, that their, you know, appearance at a town hall meeting persuaded you. And I said, please do. And it's true. You know, our kids are leading the way here. Yeah. Well, I just want to add that um, someone who spends free time when I do have it out on the water in my boat, usually miles from land, that the amount of garbage uh, really uh, is astounding. And almost all of the garbage that you see when you're out on a boat 
is that of balloons, mylar balloons, uh, latex balloons with ribbons attached to them. And, um, you know, I pick them up when I can, but there's not a time I go out on the water where I don't see two or three. I had an entire big garbage bag on the boat that I devoted just to balloon garbage. Uh, I had that filled with deflated balloons at the end of the season in 2020. So, um, and I also have, uh, I also captured an injured uh, seagull that had the, a ribbon uh, twisted around its leg. It was cutting off the circulation uh, several years before I posted that on Facebook back at the time, was able to capture it with the net and uh, lured it with some fish bait and then captured it with the net and got the ribbon off. But, um, you know, this is something that uh, we see you it's ubiquitous on our beaches and it, and we need to do what we can. I, I think that this won't stop the problem, but it's the start to the solution because obviously the balloons can travel from across the country, but um, so can the, this awareness, this awareness about it can travel across the country too. So we need to take a step. Uh, and I, and I support and favor this legislation. There, there are other ways we can have fun with kids. So do we have a, we have a second, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> um. Okay, I think that brings it up to me now. Um, resolution 1370 is to, re to amend resolution 2021-1248. And uh, this is resolved that the conference and registration hotel fees, vehicle rental and all allowable expenses, um, be adjusted to not exceed $2,500. This is in relationship to police officer Andrew Nemo and Luke McNamara, who were authorized for training session August 23rd to 27th, 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. Resolution 1371 is to approve the donation of bulletproof vests. These are vests that we no longer need. Not second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm passing carry 1372 is a budget modification for Marine Patrol, and this is moving $17,000 from New York State retirement to subcontractor costs in the same amount. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passing carry resolution 1373 is to appoint assistant town attorney Nancy Marshall. Resolved Nancy Marshall shall be hereby appointed, shall serve with the pleasure of the board as assistant town attorney, the annual salary of $90,000 for a 40 hour work week, uh, paid bi weekly. Uh, and that's effective January 3rd. Second. All Welcome in favor. Aye. 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 Pass and carry. Welcome aboard, Nancy. We're glad to have you on. So that concludes our resolutions. Does anybody have anything else to offer? No. I do not. I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session at I'm, 130. Does that work? Yeah, 130 works. Right. I make a motion to go into exec session for personnel and advice of counsel. Second. Second. All, all in favor? Aye. 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 Passed and carried. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. Be well. And uh, again, think of those who are less fortunate than ourselves and contact your food pantry and, and help them out. Thank you.